As for opportunities, look, um, look, farm REITs are becoming more popular. So they're a lot like traditional real estate REITs, uh, but the difference is it's farmland that's managed. Uh, now, if you look at a couple of the really big ones, they've been on enormous runs, incidentally, since COVID first hit back in 2020. So I would say right now that some heat needs to come out of that. In saying that, food price inflation, especially in the UK, is astronomical right now. So in the UK, yeah. UK you've got this wonderful thing called the Ag in, uh, Inflation Index. So it's basically a measure of all the farming inputs. Now that is up 23% in the last six months. But when you break it down, fertilizer is up 107% in the last uh, six months. Animal wow. feed is up 27% and fuel is up 29%. So while I'm saying these big farming REITs might have, um, their run may have happened, I'm not entirely sure that all the high prices, you know, that, the, that there still isn't a little bit of room to run. It doesn't mean though that you need to desperately run into farming REITs. That's just one idea. The other thing I think to look at. Welcome to the Exponential Investor Podcast. Want to be a better, smarter, more clued up investor? Well, you've come to the right place. We cover the breakthrough investment ideas you don't hear about in the mainstream to keep you on top of the mega trends and opportunities reshaping our world. Good morning and welcome to another episode of the Exponential Investor Podcast. I'm your editor, Sam Volkering, here with my co-editor, Shay Russell. Good to have you back with us this week, Shay. It felt, felt lonely all on my own last week, just a one-man band talking to the camera and the people out there. So it's nice to have a friendly face back on and a bit of robust conversation. It's nice to be back on a decent internet connection, Sam. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what happens when you go to Western Australia these days. Anyway, you're back in Melbourne, which is great. So you, you, we've got we've got you connected and connect, connectivity is, is, is successful. Um, before we do kick off into our discussion today, just for everybody watching, um, you may find that you've seen around the traps a little bit this week that I had conducted an interview talking about new money, new rules, uh, some of the big changes that are sweeping across not just the UK, but across the world, how it's going to impact what I believe to be everyone, how they transact, interact. Um, there's a lot of information to absorb, four key things you can do to get ahead of these sweeping changes when new money and new rules comes into effect. Um, by all means, make sure you click on any links that we have provided somewhere in the vicinity of this video and or however you've received it um, to check out that interview. It's very interesting. You'll learn a lot. Um, and uh, as I say, it's it's one of the biggest, I think most important interviews I've probably done for some time. So as I say, um, you can find access to that somewhere in and around this video today. Nonetheless, let's kick off, Shay. As I said, um, good to have some robust conversation. I want to talk about something that I've written about a little bit before, but I believe you're a little bit more clued up. You've been doing a bit of research on. And um, what sparked my interest to this area um, is that I, I went to the shop and I came home and uh, I had some mints, some lamb mints. Now, for all the vegans and vegetarians out there that, uh, uh, grossly disgusted by the fact that I had lamb mints. Uh, apologies, but tough. Uh, and so I noticed that the mints uh, was not British. Ba -ba. It had come from far, far overseas. Um, and I was curious as to why the supermarkets here in the UK wouldn't be stocking British lamb mints. Um, and I, I, I kind of have kept an eye on things quite a lot about the weekly shop. And, you know, when you go to the go to the shelves and you pick it up, you don't really think and look too hard about where it's coming from. But I started to and, and I noticed that, you know, the, the oranges weren't coming from here. The pineapple certainly isn't coming from here. The, um, the, the a lot of the meat doesn't come from here. A lot of the food that we eat in the UK doesn't come from here. And if we've learned anything over the past couple of, or well, the past month or so now, is that there's probably an element of security of supply, not just of energy, but of other things as well, that people haven't taken all that seriously. Now, as I say, Shay, I know you've been looking a lot at this. What are your thoughts on the security supply of food in the UK? 
So, uh, Sam, I used a whole bunch of choice words to describe the UK's position on food security and none that I will repeat now. Uh, but the UK is actually in a bit of a precarious position when it comes to food security or insecurity, I should say. So I spent uh, the past couple of days sort of doing a deep dive into the agricultural sector in the UK and 60% of your food is from everywhere other than the UK. Now, coming from Australia, that's really unusual for me because obviously we're a commodities-based country, we're also an agriculture-based country, so we don't really have food insecurity issues. We have supply chain issues. Uh, classic example is I haven't been able to afford lamb mince for about two and a half years, and that's because of um, local price rises, price rises that have been um, impacting us. Like lamb mince here is about thirty dollars a kilo at the moment. So, in, oh, yeah, it's, you know, we, we basically don't eat a lot of lamb right these days. Um, but it is quite alarming to see how much of the food in the UK comes from other places. Now, I believe that the UK is currently being impacted by sort of the triple whammy of events. Obviously, there was COVID that disrupted um, food supplies. Then you've gone and had Brexit. Now, I'm not entirely across all the intricacies of Brexit, but I do believe this is holding up certain um, internal and external deliveries as food travels uh, into and out of the UK. And then you've got the, um, the sort of like the third one that's happening, which is uh, labor shortages. So it turns out you've got a skilled labor shortage for abattoirs, uh, which means that uh, pigs in particular aren't right. being slaughtered on time, to use a very non-vegan friendly word there. Um, you know, there's, there's bottlenecks that are building up. Apparently there's 10 to 15% of vacancies across the UK in abattoirs. So that's quite alarming. But the absolute, tr um, the, the wild card here is just, uh, is how much of your food comes from somewhere else, namely countries that are facing conflict like uh, conflict right now. Obviously, you've got lots of wheat that comes out of Russia and the Ukraine, but also to fertilizer is a key component that comes from there. Uh -huh. uh, and it's also highly tied to gas prices as well. Uh, and this is where it starts to get a little tricky uh, and also fascinating for me, and I could bore the pants off everybody listening, um, but basically, the higher gas prices go, the higher fertilizer prices go. And this is where look at, we're looking at demand destruction in the UK because farmers are saying that they can't actually afford the fertilizer prices. So what that means they're going to do is they're going to actually reduce what they're already producing. And that is going to com uh, compound um, an already growing problem in the UK. That's interesting. How my, so when we talk about these sorts of things, the cost to produce... Like when you when you think about anything, and I, well, most people don't think about it, but I do because I'm weird like that. Is that when something lands on my dinner plate or something lands on my door from a delivery that I've purchased, I think about where it's been and where it's come from in order to get to me at this particular point, and all the all the steps within that entire supply chain that even makes it happen. So, like you say, you know. If I've got lamb mints going into a into a, a bolognese sauce or something like that, you know, it's come from the you know distribution place that that has packaged packaged it all up and put it in there. But before that, it's you know come from the abattoir, and you know before that, it's come from the farmer, and for the far, before that, you know that cow was a calf, and that calf was born from another cow, but then they needed feed and grain in order to grow those, and they needed land, and you know the, that farm probably then has tractors, and those tractors are manufactured probably by John Deere. All of a sudden, you're like, holy! You know, I've, I've just literally covered like a hundred different kinds of op business opportunities and investment ideas and all that sort of thing, but when you break things down, ultimately the cost to produce something has to make economical sense. Otherwise you go out of business. Um, and if the cost to even just put food on the shelves is getting to a point where farmers are either having to wind back their production so that they are not running themselves out of business um, or they just get out of farming altogether, it raises some interesting questions about what you know what that particular industry is facing in terms of you know like you say you, uh, is it viable are there, are there are some of these companies in this space are continuing to be viable or does the, the sector become concentrated so that some of the companies that are in that sector become more powerful and stronger because the smaller operators can't survive and so you see the there's an opportunity perhaps there rather than 
it being, you know, completely native. So a lot of these things sort of hit my brain when we start talking about cost to produce and, and, and farmers getting out. Do you think this is going to present an investment opportunity in some aspects? And, and if so, where do you think that may exist? Or is this something where, you know, agricultural sector is something that you'd probably want to take a little bit more time to, 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 to look at, I, I think, because there may be more trouble than opportunity coming soon. Um, oh, look, so yes and no to both. Um, so I agree with you. I just want to flip back to something you said right at the start is understanding the full supply chain. Um, because we all operate on the just in time supply chain, especially in Western countries, we've never had. I just realized, that, by the way, I just realized I was talking about lamb mints and then I ended up at cows. I do, I do know that lamb is not beef, just quietly. Anyway, you can, you continue, you continue, Jay. Look, that's no problem. We'll forgive you just this once. I meant sheep. I meant sheep and lambs. Sorry. <laughs> I think my, the highlight really was when you said the calf came from the cow. He's, he, he knows what's going on, guys. Um, so look, let's just go back to understanding the supply chains. I sort of really only just began to, uh, begun to understand Australia's supply chains when the bushfires happened in 2020. And it just so happened that one of the parents of my daughter's basketball team was the head of um, meat supply for Woolworths in um, Victoria. And the education I got was eye-opening and it sort of completely transformed how I look at supply chains. And I did not realize how vast it was and how many moving parts there are. And also too, how there's actually no waste from agricultural supply chains when it comes to animal parts. Everything is for sale and everything has a secondary or third purpose. Um, but yeah, what, what do you think sausages are made from? <laughs> what about the leather? That's going in your car. That's got to go to somewhere. That goes off to a tannery in uh, Italy and then it goes to China for, manu um, for manufacturing. Well, for there's, there's, a whole, there's, a whole, there's a whole other discussion we could branch off to, which maybe we'll cover on another thing, is like if you think about the major uses of leather, um, the automotive industry typically used a lot of leather as well. And all of a sudden they're shifting away from that into synthetics and other things. So there's a whole whole sector that is now not, moving towards that but anyway that's that's, that's another yeah, that's discussion that's a complete another, another discussion we'll turn that into another podcast because i do love uh, i do love to wear i do love leather anyway we'll get there as for opportunities look um look farm reits are becoming more popular so they're a lot like traditional real estate reits uh but the difference is it's farmland that's managed uh now if you look at a couple of the really big ones they've been on enormous runs incidentally since COVID first hit back in 2020. So I would say right now that some heat needs to come out of that. In saying that, food price inflation, especially in the UK, is astronomical right now. So in the UK, yeah. UK you've got this wonderful thing called the Ag in, uh, Inflation Index. So it's basically a measure of all the farming inputs. Now that is up 23% in the last six months. But when you break it down, fertilizer is up 107% in the last uh, six months. Animal wow. feed is up 27% and fuel is up 29%. So while I'm yeah. saying these big farming rates might have, um, th their run may have happened, I'm not entirely sure that all the high prices, you know, that, the, that there still isn't a little bit of room to run. It doesn't mean though that you need to desperately run into farming reaps. That's just one idea. The other thing I think to look at for are the supporting industries. So your fertilizers, your seeds, your equipment, and given um, supply chain disruptions, companies that can service farming equipment. I, I think that's something to really keep an eye on right now. Uh, also distributors and processors like abattoirs, um, you know, like the manufacturers and your, uh, your canning facilities, for example. I think they're flow on opportunities from this food disruption that are absolutely worth looking at. Um, from a right down the bottom line, how many, how much of these uh, how well supermarkets will do. Look, they'll do okay. They tend to ref um, survive inflationary pressures reasonably well compared to other types of mm. securities, uh, but they might not be where the biggest opportunity is right now. Yeah, it's interesting. I've, I've thought about, you know, how do the supermarkets face these kinds of pressures moving forward? Because ultimately people don't stop buying groceries. What they do is they're more selective about what kind of groceries they spend on. And so it almost sort of counterbalances where you get increased prices, but then people's, people wind back what their typical food shop might be to 
some of the goods that are existing in the supermarket, some of the lower lower price things. And so ultimately the, the supermarkets don't necessarily boom, but at least they don't necessarily bust. bust <laughs> yeah. um, I, I like to think, you know, when, when it comes to, to these kinds of issues that face the supply chain, if we think about agricultural industry specifically, about rising costs, like you say, fuel. You know, if you think about the rising cost of fuel, you know, the the thing that springs to my mind then is, well, where are the opportunities for the technologies that remove that from the equation? And so the instinctive thing is to look at, you know, companies that are providing agricultural equipment that are either battery powered, so electric vehicles or hydrogen power. I know JCB over here, big company, uh, really pushing hard into hydrogen um, for their, you know, industrial in- equipment, um, and that that's not just agriculture. That's you know all sorts of you know excavators and, and mining, digging stuff. Um, those I think, and, and again, I mentioned John Deere earlier. I, mean, I remember a couple of years ago, um, you know, John Deere were you know heavily looking at electrification of their um, agricultural equipment, but then also autonomous systems as well. So again, you can start to take out some of the inefficiencies of this sector, help to ease some of those cost burdens by introducing new technologies. Um, and so that's that's where I tend to sort of float my mind to. The thing is, is that those are never, if we've got a food issue today in the supply chain and on the shelves, those sorts of technologies aren't necessarily going to switch on tomorrow. Um, it's it's sort of been seeping in gradually over time, but it's certainly not uh, the major part of of this sector. But it's it's that you know preventative for the next five years or so. But again, an interesting thing to 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 think about as an investor, I think, in a period where markets are volatile, tech tends to have been smashed across the board, no matter what it is at the moment. But when you think about the issues now that we face, you know. I should preface this with, you know, we're not going to run out of food in the UK. They, 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 as, as much as I've said, there will be a food shortage previously. And I think there will be. That doesn't mean we're going to run out. It's it more just means it's going to continue to get more food. expensive. You'll, you'll, yeah, more expensive and run out of choice. I think you're looking at yeah. two options rather than five, for example. Exactly, exactly. And so that, that causes some, some issues and it continues to add to the pressures on the average household about just the cost of living. Having said that, to ease those cost of living burdens and to ease these issues is that, you know, the, the changes that need to come quite possibly get accelerated and then more 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 money gets printed and people, it, by the way, anyone that thinks that the, the central bank and the government is just going to stop printing money to fund their way out of these issues, you're kidding yourself. Again, so this this continues to the, play into this story that we've been saying about inflation is not just going to disappear overnight. Um, nonetheless, that then does money that flows into these other sectors and opportunities. So there's a lot sort of, like you say, when you learn about the supply chain and you learn about how different, how many different moving parts there are to it, you come to realize that there are areas of crisis that are, are genuine concerns and worries. And, um, and you know as well as I do, Shay, that, and particularly I think you have a similar view, is that within crisis comes opportunity uh, for the investor. And I think that's where we should you know, always try and keep a half eye on at least. Yeah, look, I completely agree with you. And while you mentioned before about the push to electric vehicles, you know what, you know what's that old saying, the cure for high prices is high prices. Uh, I think you're going to see that push for innovation because, um, you know, there's many people in the UK who are already doing it tough. So these high prices aren't going to do well for the economy, economy overall. So governments, I think, will be more open to encouraging innovation. Um, uh, there's a couple of things I read today that talk about how the UK is limited on what it can grow because of the type of soil that you've got. So it could be a case of the fact that, you know, a lot of money is spent in um, innovative agriculture. And basically, look, already speeding up a process that's been underway for decades now. Um, food, you know, food shortages and food crises aren't new, crises aren't new to the globe. Uh, but I think what we're going to see is that they're more likely to spend, there's going to be grant money. Um, there'll be supplements yeah. and things like that to spur on this innovation to end this reliance. Uh, it's a topic I've thrown around the eye um, somewhere else. But basically, I think we're seeing, um, you know, the birth of economic nationalism. The just-in-time supply chains have hurt us. And we're going to see increasingly nationalistic policies that drive investment back home 
at the expense of the tax, tax matter, mind you, and this leans into that, they're not going to stop printing money. I think they're going to do everything they can to bring it back to a place where we can be as, in, well, in the UK's example, as independent as possible for as many resources as possible. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think people have, have sort of coined this as the end of globalization. I don't think it's the end of globalization, but I think it's certainly a much more concerted effort to focus on the domestic production of, of goods and services and commodities and, and be a little bit more self-reliant than relying on others who you can't always necessarily trust. But anyway, we've gone on long enough this week. Um, plenty to, to think about and consider. Um, for everybody watching, I will be away next week. So Shay is uh, running the show. I don't know. I think you might have a, a guest lined up already. I'm not sure. I'll leave that up to you. Leave the viewers in anticip hot anticipation of what's coming next week without my ugly mug on the screen. Uh, but anyway, thanks for tuning in and listening and watching this week, everybody. Um, Hopefully you've got a lot out of our discussion today. Not too worried, but look for the opportunities. Um, thanks again for watching. We'll be back with you again soon. Uh, me in a couple of weeks. Share with you next week. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.